They're low, slow, and apparently super duper fun. But W, T, F, what the f are these things? And more importantly, why? So hold on to your buns, my future rascal owning friends, because we're going bumper to bumper, fender to tail, on a gang of scooters! I'd like to thank Nas Energy Drink for partnering with Bumper to Bumper. I couldn't be more thankful. And to show them my true appreciation, I wrote them a big thank you card. Thank you, Nas Energy Drink. Dear Nas Energy Drink, thanks for helping me not be so tired. Love, James. Now, Back to the show. <laughs> Let's start off by saying this isn't gonna be your typical bumper to bumper. Obviously, I'm sitting next to a freaking scooter. We skipped over a car this week because when I saw these guys on Instagram, I thought to myself, these guys get it. These guys know what's cool. And after meeting them, I'm happy to report that I was right. This is right up my alley and therefore I feel like it's my responsibility as your big bro to bring this scene to the attention of you D-holes. So first and foremost, what are these colorful two-wheelers you see beside and behind me? Well, the best way to describe them would be old Japanese scooters modified in a period correct kind of way. I know, it's catchy. Now if you look at them and think, hey, I've seen some of these things on the internet. Those are both Sosoku scooters. Well, hold your freaking buff horses, Bubba. That's a bit misleading. Bosuzoku literally means violent running tribe. And back in the 70s and 80s, they were gangs of rebellious working class teens that had gained a reputation, among other things, for modifying their motorcycles to the extreme with tall rear seats, stretched out handlebars, and flashy paint jobs. The motorcycle scene also influenced cars. We did an episode on a Bosuzoku Toyota Cressida. Go watch it after you finish this video because retention is very important to us. The Boso scene inspired less gangy Japanese scooter enthusiasts to alter the appearance of their trusty bikes. And what you see here are multiple examples of such creations. It all starts with a very specific type of scooter built in the mid 80s, the Honda Tact, the Yamaha Jog, and the 1997 Honda Elite. We'll start with the Honda Tact, as it's probably the most common model in the scene. Called the Aero 50 in the States, it was Honda's first fully modern 50cc scooter sold in North America back in 1983. With a 50cc two-stroke motor, you'll be mixing gas and slapping ass on this bad boy. Two-stroke motors need oil added to the fuel to lubricate the crankcase and rings, hence that really, really funny pun I said like four seconds ago. <laughs> The Yamaha Jog is another model named after my least favorite high school gym activity and was only offered from 86 to 87. And lastly, the Honda DJ1, or the Elite as we called it. There are more scooters that are modified to match this style, but these are the main ones that were exported at the time and can be converted to the Japanese domestic market spec. These are the scooters that get the special treatment. And that treatment boils down to a few key things. First, let's talk about fairings. The Japanese models have different fairings with different colorways. So if you're interested in doing your own 80s Japanese scooter build and can't ship over a Japanese model, buy a US version and go source some OG fairings, baby. That's what Nigel did with his Marlboro themed Honda Aero 50 with tacked fairings. So while this scooter has all the Japanese fairings, what really makes it unique, aside from the paint, which we'll get into, is the custom long rear tail and belly cowl. 
These pieces were a common addition in the custom scooter scene in Japan. And this scoot scoot kept faithful to the look of that time. It makes the scooter eye catching, even racy if you can believe it. As if that big old tail is gonna keep the back end down when you're rolling down the street going 35 miles per hour. Is it functional? No. Is it cool looking? Yes. Very, very yes. The second thing is the stance of the scooter, if you will. These babies sit low, and there's a reason. The rear shock spring is completely taken off. What happens when you leave the shock in and take the spring out? Well, you essentially only have the dampening from the shock and no spring to support the weight of you or the scooter. So the seat and the tires act as your suspension. Apparently, there's enough cushion in the push-in, i.e. the seat, and flex in the tires that they're still pretty comfortable. Now the back end is low. The most obvious next step would be to lower the front end. How do you do that? Take the springs out of the forks. Why do you do this? Well, because they're keeping it true to the OG 80s. Take the springs out, throw some skateboard truck bushings on the ends of the internal fork shafts and bada bing, scooter boom, you're rolling around low, baby. You got that low lifestyle. For all you performance junkies out there, a scooter build wouldn't be complete unless you modded the power plant a little. The stock expansion chamber is swapped out for an aftermarket pipe. These scooters have around four hearse per, so anything to get an extra boost is welcome, even if it just makes it sound faster. The final piece of the puzzle is the paint job. Now back in the Dizze, scooters rolling off the assembly line would sport liveries of special edition tie-ins with fashion lines like Corres. Horrors was a French fashion brand that had a partnership with Honda, providing baby blue and pink accessories for both Honda scooters and cars. Was there ever a Gucci or a Fendi partnership with a Japanese scooter? Not that I'm aware of, but hey, maybe this is the next best thing. Other scooters like this pink polka dotted 1987 Honda Elite are a throwback to when Honda would advertise their scooters with bows and polka dots as a way for women to get a taste for the male dominated motorcycle scene. The assembly line that built these scooters even had all female workers. Honda wanted to dominate the market and to do that, they needed to entice the other 50% of the world's population. So what kind of person takes a scooter from the mid 80s, customizes it to match the look of the time, a time specific to a country halfway around the world, and then drive them around the streets of Southern California in a flock? A flock of scooters? The majority are part of Beautiful Boy Racing Car Club. They started off in the drift scene, but drifting is an expensive and competitive hobby. So putting their love for Japanese car culture to good use, they got into Kaido Racers. And sprouting off from their Kaido Racing builds are the scooters. The same DIY aspects that the group loves about Kaido Racers, they applied to these relatively cheap scooters. But just because something is cheap doesn't mean it's worth doing. So why on earth would you want to spend your time and money building this? In Japan, the scooter is an essential form of transportation that is generally regarded as the standard alongside cars. Whereas in the West, they're still kind of toys and hobby vehicles. When you first look at these scooters, you might think, is this a joke? I mean, there's no denying these things are ridiculous, but it doesn't matter what vehicle you tool with, there's always a community who will also join in on the fun. And the bottom line <laughs> is these things are fun. So, if you can go out and design a unique vehicle that's cheap and fun, all while building a community, why not? 